possible, if that's possible. Um, and we'll start talks in about 10 minutes. It's made a huge difference. It oh, is. I, my code got so raw last time. Yeah. Um, so if the speaker's going to be on, or wants to be on video, they have to stand up. Where's Professor Morning? My guess is he's had his test. He's had his test a minute ago.
Dan has made a timer as well, so that people know if they're so it depends. Some until the speaker's finished and uh, everyone will get a slice of pizza, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Right, okay, so, do you want to Thank <laughs> you. 
last 15 inches to web server, I have an index file that just keeps track of the image checksums. It downloads this thing every 15 minutes to apply. If the image is there, it will download it with very good. I spent quite a while trying to figure out the cheapest tariff to do this with, because no mobile phone providers seem to want to give you a tariff for only transferring 15 a month. They want to sell you multiple gigabytes for tens of pounds, which is kind of very low money price range. In the end, I found three tariffs that might work. One was T-Mobile with their prepaid thing, where you top up 20 pounds and get six months of so-called unlimited internet, so average of three pounds per three month. The annoying thing about it is being prepaid is six months Every six months, someone's got to go and top up that phone and sort out the internet boost on it before anything uses any credit. Because if someone spends one week going online, you then lost your 20 pounds and you're not through. So I actually initially went with Vodafone, who said they were charging three pounds a month, giving you 250 meg, and then couldn't count and decided it five pounds. After a catalog of other errors, I decided to leave them. <laughs> and a small company called Andrews and Arnolds, who actually resell Free's network. And they charge £2.40 a month and then 2 p free train line. So far, they're working out a lot better than both phones in terms of their online account management system, actually, unless they log in. <laughs> so, this is the, the setup. This is done at Christmas. This is my grandmother in law's TV with a picture from my sister in law showing her the Christmas tree. And you'll actually see here there's a slight error in the way the email came through. It actually says, sent from my Samsung Galaxy Note, which I've since read all the script and pulled those things out. And basically, it was Raspberry Pi, HDMI cable, which I'm pretty good. I have a duplicate this set up at the back, and hopefully later on, we should be able to move our pictures to it and see it working in action. So, for costs, I said it had to be under £50. I got the Raspberry Pi for about £30. I got the power adapter for free. It's an old phone charger that was repurposed. 3G dongle was £20. HDMI cable was from Poundland, and an on top of box from Poundland as well as the other region. The checking feature I mentioned earlier, I actually wrote an HTML5 um, geolocation plugin. So you just visit a web page, it pulls the geolocation data from the device if you're supplying it, and then uploads it to the web server, and it just asks you for your name, and just assumes you can put the same name every time. And then these create into images for the street map and display them on the browser pi. This is just a test one I did. Now, uh, I had a few technical difficulties as you do with any project and things I wasn't expecting. Firstly, the Raspberry Pi has become somewhat notorious for not providing enough USB power. And the Raspberry Pi I was using actually arrived about a year ago, so it's part of the original batch. It seemed to have some particular design faults in the way they supply USB power. And I could not get 3G dongle to work with it. It would start the connection process and the whole file would just reboot. It wasn't enough power. And I didn't want to spend the HMI on um, Power Hub, so what I did was I hijacked the incoming power line to the Raspberry Pi and redirected it into a USB um, extension cable, and then plugged the 3D dongle into that, and that seemed to work. The other problem was I bought the USB extension cable from Poundland, and normally the red line is the five volts, and the black line is the ground. But it seems that to save some money, Poundland don't use red and black, or uh, they use pink and white, I think. <laughs> it took me quite a while to figure out which one is which, and there was a moment where I just had to get the code line really quick, right? Of course, I did. <coughs> um, I still, even with that, could not get the brand new phone phone supply 3D novel to work. But I had a much older one from 3 that I unlocked, and that would seem to work fine. So again, I just swapped the brand and used the phone phone one and the personal one. I don't yet understand why that should draw more power. It works at higher data rates. And I found that the, the default Raspbian image, which is Debian for the Raspberry Pi, which at the time was the only real general purpose distro, is somewhat bloated. I think it's about one and a half gigabytes by default. It includes an X server, it includes a scratch program language, it includes games. I spent a good day actually just bringing stuff out of this image that I did with me. Since I wrote this, I think a few other distributions have come online. I'm just open WRT, which is for the the Linux system we got to use originally has actually become available for us in time. I think that will do the job of this. And the XT4 file system that it uses by default doesn't like being powered off randomly. And of course, I've given this the explicit instructions here. It's fine to unplug it, nothing will go wrong. 
And to go around that, if I can the file system read enemy, which I thought would prevent it having any damage, because it's never writing anything to the file system. For some reason, it still damaged itself, and after two months of this thing being in operation, I got a message from someone saying, it's saying, press control D and enter the password, but I don't have a keyboard plug for you, so how do I do this? <laughs> So since then, I've just remastered the image to use something called SquashFS, which is a VMware file system for Linux. And hopefully, that will solve that problem. And actually, I'm visiting my grandmother-in-law, who I was with this weekend, and giving her an updated SD card from that one. If you want to have a go yourself, if you send an email with a photo attached to drasp.py.frame at gmail.com, it should appear within a few minutes on the TV screen up and set up the back of the room. Please don't send anything dodgy, I know. <laughs> no, if this is a separate system, I might save the two from each other. And if you want the source code, it's on my website at the URL. Well, I'll just put projects. <laughs> yeah, probably it's about creating a web server. Any other questions? Roger? I've got a really bad time to resolve a kid like me going to television as much as I like on Facebook. <laughs> great work with radio. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it's my audience. Sending pictures over the radio, I think it's called television. <laughs> Restrictions on a firewall 
so an example of that would be if you're connected to a network and you only have HTTP, DNS, MISCMP traffic available for allowing to go through the firewall, you would initiate a covert channel. That would then allow you to use protocols like SSH or anything else which you want, which is not allowed by firewall. That's what a covert channel is. And basically it disguises your packets. So SSH packets will be disguised as ICMP being packets and pass the file without protection. Mm -hmm. There are two main methods for covert communications. These are, are um, bit manipulation and optional fields. Basically, for a bit manipulation, um, what you do is if you have a protocol which uses a field uh, that has a maximum size of, say, 8 bits, you can use and try that again. Yeah, protocol which has a field using a maximum of 8 bits and protocol uses, say, 4 bits. You have 4 bits there which you can use, which are unused, and you can insert your covert data into these unused bits and it should pass through. Uh, downside of that is uh, there is only a 4 bit per packet uh, through the firewall, so the firewall can be pretty slow. Uh, other ones, so for that, you can use IP's ID field and DCP's uh, initial sequence number field. And the other one is optional fields. And this is where fields don't use. Protocol isn't using the field, or it's optional. And the DNS our data field is an optional field, and you can use that as a code channel or something that's nice in chamber. Um, Basically, what you do is if it's not showing you, taking your code data on there. <laughs> uh, here is an example of ICMP request. Uh, okay, and this is the payload here, which is the standard uh, Unix uh, payload. It doesn't get checked by most firewalls, so you can replace it with your code data. And here we have HTTP packets being replaced, replacing the payload for. A type A uh, request. Okay. Uh, it's a very, very quick introduction to what is COVID channel. <laughs> <laughs> There's, um, like I was saying here, the ICMP request packets. Um, there's a fully working uh, open source program called Pingtel, which does exactly that. Have you read uh, Little Brother by Bobby Dodge? You might like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have you looked into stereography? Yes, I have. Because that's kind of a. <laughs> That's kind of another kind of channel, isn't it? Yeah. It's sort of hiding data in plain sight. Yeah, well, it's essentially the image. It's hiding data inside images. Yeah. That's very simple. Yes. Okay. Do you have any talk about what you can play with? Yeah, if you find any GitHub or just talk to me afterwards and I can point you to the source. So, oh, that's loud. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm Sam Jones, 
and by talking about a small quote which I wrote recently titled a help and assignment called Spotter. It's a command line tool and it, what it does is as simple as taking a list of file name patterns that paired with command commands to run when those files change. Uh, there are already existing tools to do that. Uh, this, is an example, this is an example of a couple with identify. They're going to be an awkward to use because you're either having to write scripts to run to do them or remember command line, command line commands. That's a really awkward phrase. <laughs> there are also three libraries like Watcher, which is which takes really script files, and you have to write code that will, that will match file in pattern. And then do something with it, which is a bit close to Spotter. But, but I didn't like any of these, and they don't require me to require any long, awkward script files to do, to do simple things I wanted, and they got hard, hard to manage after a while. So I went to most Spotter, which is very simple to, to understand and to read. Doesn't need anyone, doesn't need you to understand the programming language. I had to learn Ruby to use Watcher, which was painful. Um, and it means I can store the commands and the files that they need to be run for with, with the project. So, if, so the files that Spot takes are made of commands like this, where you have a file name pattern and then the commands to run well, when that file name changes. And you can also do things like putting a file in command, which is necessary for some of the commands. It has a few other options. You can do things like running commands at the start and end of the session. So when you start water, it'll run any, any of the start commands. When you end it, it'll run one mode, which is very useful for doing things like set, setting things up that you need and cleaning them up afterwards, but that you don't need to keep permanently. You can also define constants, which are a name and a value, which you can then use in, in, in inside the commands. Uh, this, 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 was, this was added so I could run a command when the session started and then run the same command, but possibly modify when a file actually changed, so that I wasn't having to change a file just to, to build something when, when, when um, it started. Uh, this this was the main example of it that I've been using. It's cut down a bit to make it fit in the but I'm really not very good at keeping my feel like that, am I? Yeah, it, this is an example that I watch te text files, then when they change, it'll compile them, it'll compile them and print a count, count of how many word, word, right? it'll print a count of how many word, words I've done. And then when I finish, it'll clean up all of the files that latex needs found that I'm not going to clean in the future. And that meant that I could do things like this. So a lot of the time people would use a specific text editor that will show you a preview of a latex file as you're writing it. But if you use a different editor like Vim or Paint, you can't always do that. And so this is this is me using Spotter, which means when I change that and save it, it'll really recompile it in the terminal down there, and then the the viewer will refresh and show you what I've actually done. And then this is the example that I was actually using when I built this program, which compiled my HCI um, website, and it uses. It uses several of these I had to implement that did a bit more than just watching a single file and then doing something. Uh, so that's that spotter. It's available on GitHub there. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I think the syntax is very similar to Bay Plus. I could, but uh, make files a bit awkward for something like this. They're, almost, they're, they're very similar, but this is simpler. I, 
Print was, was something our lab experiments were using for exactly the same thing in the past, but they can get awkward and they have funny rules about syntax and when things get even bothered. The, the, the biggest thing with this was that it was intended to be as simple as possible to do, whereas most of the other terms to be used can be quite complicated and you have to understand the various funny rules of when they're model things or understand the language to be able to do them. Anyone else? While well, you were set up, I just realised I forgot to tell you something. Um, the stickers, uh, the reason why you're supposed to hold on to them is because the person to win the audio is whoever gets the most stickers. So the aim is to give away the stickers to whoever you think is most deserving. And it's up to you to decide why someone might deserve a sticker. Um, maybe they gave a really good presentation. Maybe they've got something really cool on, on display. Maybe they like their t-shirts, you know. Whatever, just whoever gets the most stickers at the end will, will be the winner. Um, so this will be Neil Snorkel, and then we'll have uh, a stop for beer and a look around. John, can you say, you say really cool, but this, this is awesome. Okay, so uh, right uh, about uh, eight weeks ago, I made the mistake of talking to some glaciologists, uh, and it turns out that they do loads of good stuff up in Greenland, uh, trying to analyse glaciers and all this kind of stuff. I'm not going to talk about that science at all. It's all really interesting and fun. But it's not. Uh, my part of this was that they survey these things, in particular uh, the front of these kinds of glaciers, um, but it costs a lot of money because sending helicopters out there regularly to need to compare what's changing. Helicopters are expensive to put in the air. Boats are a little bit dangerous because you've got icebergs everywhere and so on. So we, 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 we dreamt up this idea of making something that would fly over them and not the data uh, and take pictures and so on. And uh, well, the result is here. Okay. Um, it's based on standard radio control type stuff, but the, the, the clever bit is uh, an Arduino uh, based microcontroller which is acting as an autopilot. And there's a really nice open source project with ID environment out there, which you need to do a bit of work on to make it work, but I've been doing that bit of work. It's, um, it's, it's inside there. Um, okay, so that's the plan. What I'm going to do now is simply to show you, uh, proof is always more pudding, isn't it? Uh, to show you some video from, uh, from the test flight. The first test flight was actually about two weeks ago, um, and on Wednesday I did a 15-kilometer flight up the WS through with it, which uh, I will I, I'll play it during the, the break on the UPC. Yeah. But I'll just show you a few key points now. Right? Uh, okay, so this was a test flight up in the Flying Club in Penryn Corp about two weeks ago. That's the, the, the waypoints, the GPS waypoints that I want to fly, fly to. Okay? And, uh, this is my fingers in front of the camera because the camera is mounted just down in front there, right at the very front there at the bottom. Um, there's a camera that was just not dislodged. It's, it's only held on with Velcro. Fact, a lot of it's held on with Velcro. Velcro is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good stuff because it makes it really easy to move things around. And, yeah. So I'm just about to lob it now. So you just hold it above your head, open the throttle, lob it. I'm, I've got a radio control set up now on it, so I'm flying it manually with the radio control to save height. Uh, so it gets to about uh, 80, 90 meters, and then in a minute I'll flip the switch and put it into autonomous mode, and then it'll start flying its waypoint. Um, there we are now. Okay. So the motor goes off, you probably couldn't hear it, but the motor went off for a second whilst we computed its, its waypoint, its course. Uh, so now it's flying uh, all on its own, and I will skip through some chunks of this. Uh, well, I'll let, it, I'll, let, I'll, I'll let you watch it do a couple of turns. It's, it's doing a zigzag track. It's actually going the altitude. The course is, is going the altitude. It uses a GPS for um, course altitude, and then there's a parametric pressure sensor which it uses for, for fine altitude, you know, because moment by moment altitude, the GPS isn't that accurate. It's very accurate this, but 10 meters or something. Uh, in fact, the, the altitude is less than that. Okay, so it's flying around on its own now. If I skip forward through to, let's say, uh, I'll whiz through uh, to, uh, let's say, I think I just made some notes here as to where, okay. Uh, this is where you uh, start going from kind of a blue sky research idea into uh, not such blue skies. 
So this is where the real world comes and bites you, because at this point I was thinking, yeah, I can't actually see it anymore. <laughs> uh, actually, what was the worst was I thought, it's all right, I can still hear it. And then as it goes into the thicker cloud, I can't even hear it now. Um, so then I thought, well, should I take it out of autopilot mode, put my sticks in, put the sticks in the corner, and make it spiral dive down until it gets to the floor. And actually thought, well, it hasn't got all that much longer to go, so I'll, I'll just let it carry on. So if I skip a little bit further through, it eventually, uh, about there, will come out of the clouds, I think. Then, then I go, ah, oh, phew. <laughs> it was a, actually, what was going through my mind was, I wonder how much moisture is going to go into that hole at the front and into the uh, electronics, but actually, uh, then I realised there was another phone in there uh, to hold the camera in, so it was okay. So, so it's, it was flying around uh, nicely, but what I do now is if I skip through further to five, 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 five. Actually, there's some nice views of Penryn Cork, if anybody knows Penryn Cork. It's on the left-hand side there. I'm up on Bon Gok, which is on the top of the hill, above Penryn. And if you look in a minute there, that's Penryn Cork hiding behind the clouds. Uh, there's a farm down there. Okay. So then it carries on flying, and then it gets to a point um, once it's finished the waypoints, what happens then is it attempts to go home, it'll come back to the point at which it was at when you turn the GPS on and GPS initialised, and I set it uh, to halt, to, to just, it just circuits there to about 90 metres until we do something, so until I put it back into manual mode effectively. So it's now, because it's trying to lose several hundred metres of height, it just, the autopilot just says I don't need any power, so it's turned the motor off, and it just glides around and around and around in a big circle. Um, and then at about... Uh, it's still gliding around now in a big circle. You can see the, the bank on it because it's just going around. It's set to a maximum of 45 degrees bank, so it won't bank any more than 45 degrees. Um, it also won't go up at any more than 20 degrees, it won't go down at any more than 25 degrees. Then the motor's just come back on now, those at the front probably hear it, the rest of you can't. Uh, and it's just going to loiter round and round and round now. So that was, that was the flight successful. I'll give you some data on it in a sec. Uh, you might like to see the very end because. One of the hazards, uh, it took me two attempts to land it this time, because one of the hazards at our flying field is the farmer who, uh, did I miss that actually? Uh, no, I was trying to land it on this approach, but then uh, you might notice I'm stood over here, so I can't quite see the line of sight, and then <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was windy, right? <laughs> There was, there, was, there was 18 mile an hour plus the wind, so it was actually quite. I mean, the space rotation was working really well because it was actually a handful of flight manually. Oh, so, so, so I actually chickened out, as it were, when I saw the sheep. <laughs> um, we haven't hit many sheep that has actually been known to happen. I, I think the next time round I managed to get it down okay. Uh, so this, this time I think we succeeded uh, getting it down. <laughs> yeah, still there, don't move. I mean, stupid. they'll just sit there anyway, so there we are, back on the deck. Right. So, right. What, what you might like to see is the, um, what you might like to see is the box, because uh, th this is the raw data of the GPS logger that's on board, so you can see the three the three waypoints, the three waypoints, you can see it gaining altitude, and then you can see the spiral down at the end. Don't worry about the big long lines, those are just, you get the occasional GPS glitch. I find I get about one every minute. You get what, it's at ten, ten times a second it takes GPS readings, and about one a minute will be a really bizarre value, um, and I haven't quite got to the bottom of the lane. It doesn't affect the flight performance because it cancels itself out on this room. I did the same flight again later in the day and got the red plot. Um, the circles are different places because obviously I took it off from a different place. But you can see it followed almost exactly the same waypoints, yeah, the same altitude, same course program done, yeah. So the GPS is actually pretty accurate on that. I think that's what's going on. Um, okay, and uh, how far did we go on that one? Uh, I think I've got here the actual Google Earth for that one. Um, yeah, that's the actual Google Earth. So at the bottom of the screen there, you can see uh, that's the wrong one actually. That's the long one, sorry. That was a duration test. 
Um, that was a much longer track. It's not that flight, it's a different flight. But on that one, I just did one long loop and then I let it circle for quite a long time, just for about 40 minutes to see how long it would fly for. And so I flew it for 40 minutes. And you can see at the bottom, it actually did uh, 32 kilometers distance altogether um, over a, uh, about a um, 40 minute, 44 second flight. Okay. And actually, the battery pack was around about half discharged when I refilled it. It's a 10 amp hour pack and I put 5 amp hours back into it. So actually, my, get, my estimate is it's actually got about 60 kilometers range. Um, and it flies to be at about 50 kilometers an hour with the average amount of speed it flies at. So actually, for the glaciologist, that's much more than we wanted. We only wanted 15 kilometers, actually. That was our, that was our spec, was 15 kilometers. So uh, 20 would have been safety margin. So we can actually fly two or three flights with one battery pack. But that recharging is actually quite, quite nice. OK, so um, that's. Uh, that's, that's that flight. Uh, we did another flight, which I'll leave on the projector whilst we have pizza in a second. And that was um, here. Uh, I'm going to go there. Uh, I'm going to go there. Uh, my Google Earth has died. Oh, okay, now it's, oh, where'd that window go? Okay. Go away. Go away. <laughs> it, 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 it can't click on that. It won't click away. It won't click away. Okay, never mind. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> so, to do a more realistic flight for the mission, we did one uh, in a remote part of the W estuary. So it's, it's quite scenic actually because there's lots of nice sand dunes and sand banks and so on. So what I'll do is I'll I'll set this one playing. Then have we got food arrived? Um, it will be here for the next. Okay. So I can show you the plot then. The food's arriving. We can. Um, this is a 15 kilometre uh, mission over the W estuary on Wednesday. So the idea was to fly up the estuary. That's looking up the estuary. That's my van, yeah. Uh, and, that's, and that's the launch site. Uh, and that was the launch. And then what I actually did was I let it loiter for a couple of turns just to make sure the altitude has got a good fix on it. I've got the altitude program driving all the rest of it. Um, and so this is manual mode, so it's quite bumpy and lumpy because I'm just controlling it with sticks. But uh, then it goes into loiter mode, so it'll set itself down, go into some circuits. Um, the colours are really nice on my screen, but unfortunately on the projector they're a bit washed out, but, uh, but that's nice. Yes. That's, that's the Duffy Estuary there, um, that's the Abbott Park, and then we're looking up, up there, it's, it's Abbott on the other side there. Uh, so it does two circuits, and then in a minute, I've put some captions on it so it'll tell you where it's got to and what it's doing. Uh, It'll head off now, there we are. I flip the switch there to put it into its mission, so it climbs up to a couple hundred metres, then it's going to head off up to the end of the uh, estuary, right above the middle of the estuary entrance, it's going to turn right, it's then going to head all the way up over all the mud flats and so on, uh, seven kilometres up, it's going to then uh, turn right across the estuary, uh, and then back along uh, near where the train track goes, if you've been on the train to Birmingham, it's, it's going to come back along, so you can see the train track down on the left hand side. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it running and uh, you can watch it if you're in the Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so the pizza should be here. It's coming later today, so we'll take the pizza slow. Uh, okay. And I think we've got quite a few people and things to show up. So, I suppose, drink, be merry, and wander around. When will the talks start again? The talks will start again shortly. Well, I suppose once all the pizza's gone. Once but it hasn't arrived yet. So, a good half hour. We've got a good half hour to chill out and, and you know, move along. So, the pizza's turn out in 25 minutes. The pizza's gone in 25 minutes. Pretty much, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think Neil's going to come
Oh, and when we when we come back, we've got James, then Alex, then David, and then my, uh, no, Matt. Sorry, Matthew. Yeah. Good luck. BCS goodies, leaflets, information on uh, membership. Yeah, we've, we've got uh, headphone organisers, BCS headphone cord organisers. So grab them quickly. Thank <laughs> you. 
So 
know it's <laughs> we need to be if you have that permission oh yeah yeah good left I have resolution that's what you have to so, uh, so, 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 uh, and we've got James up next, followed by Alex and David and Matthew. Okay? Good. So for those that are interested, I've just got, I'm just hijacking here for a second whilst they're going to that. I've just got the, the final end of that line with the, the Google plots. And so you can see here, the, the red line is the altitude. So you can see it went up and all the way up and descended at the end. The blue line is the velocity, it's the ground speed of the log. So you can see that there was a tailwind going from the estuary up to here, which is about four kilometers. The, the wind speed was, and the ground speed was higher here, uh, and then as the turn around to come back, the ground speed is much less, well, 10 kilometers or so less, because it's in a headwind, yeah? Um, so you can actually see on the top, so you can also see there were gusts, and you can see gusts on the water in the hike in the, in the HD video as well, um, but they're not really visible on the objector. So you can see there were quite consistent gusts of wind of, of about 10 kilometers an hour up the estuary, and you can actually see them on the water, and then you can see them on the flops as well when you do it. So anyway, uh, time to move on, I guess. TV, um, and it 
he does uh, sort of scientific debunking and things. Um, he talks about uh, bad science and, and how people try and uh, sort of pull the wool over your eyes and that sort of thing. Uh, but anyway, he's, a, he's an actual GP and he's quoted, he, he has a problem with the fact that there's so much medical literature out there uh, and there's just not enough time for them to read it. 15 million medical articles published so far, 5,000 journals every month. So picking out what's relevant is a really financial task. Uh, and this isn't just in medical, this is you know across science, there's a lot of papers and if you're looking for something specific, it's pretty difficult to find what you're after. So, that's where Patrick comes in. Uh, basically what it does is, the papers go in, it analyzes them, and then it helps researchers find relevant material. So, uh, quickly how it works. Uh, the first thing is, uh, people submit papers to the system and they're kind of uploaded. Uh, it supports PDF uploads and it also supports uh, sort of, uh, an XML format, which is quite widely used um, across scientific disciplines. Uh, some of the big journals use it, like PLOS, um, but, but PDF is always good anyway. So, uh, if it is a PDF, it's converted into this XML format so we can process it. Uh, and then things are all sort of split up and, and, and the processing begins. Um, the next part is the uh, machine learning bit, which is actually really interesting. Um, we have a tool called Sapienta, which one of my supervisors, Maria, um, developed. Uh, and this basically takes sentences in a scientific paper and annotates them using core scientific concepts. So I'm going to talk quickly about those in a minute. So I'll just leave you in the line of that. Um, so it annotates these, these sentences uh, and then it uses some random decision for us to decide what sort of paper we're reading. So you can have uh, case studies, you can have uh, research papers, review papers, things like that. Uh, and then what I'm planning to do over the summer is uh, set up the ability to classify the subject, so whether it's a physics paper or a maths paper or something like that. Uh, finally, uh, the papers are stored in a database, and uh, whoever uploaded them gets an email saying that it's now ready to be used. Um, so uh, I'm just going to pick up on the uh, core scientific concepts thing. So, uh, like I said, my supervisor kind of invented the so what we'll discover them. Um, they're kind of reflective of things you'd expect in a scientific paper. Things like hypotheses, goals, background information, that sort of thing. Um, so just the sort of standard stuff you'd expect to find in a scientific paper. Um, and we, we've got a tool that is able to find and analyse sentences and decide what which concept is inside it. Uh, so I've got a couple of examples here. Um, so this is a hypothesis data, uh, sentence. It's expected that Tony Sparks at Mark 43 suit will fulfill all user expectations when it's announced today. Uh, so that's hypothesis, because well, there's an expectation element in there. Um, and Sapienza would probably lay label as a hypothesis. Uh, this is a background sentence. Uh, upsetting Linus is a really bad idea, because when he gets angry, he becomes the incredible tux. Um, like, this is a background sentence, uh, it just gives you background information, it, it doesn't really convey any expectation or anything. Uh, so those are just two of the simple processes and how they might sort of piece together in the software. Um, so when all the data is stored, we've got this query interface which allows you to search for papers, uh, and you can find, you, you can search for things by their core SCs. so you can say I want to see um, something that's in the hypothesis, uh, you can filter by types, uh, and then I'll show you the profile page as well, which kind of gives you an overview of the paper and how it's made up. So I'm just going to click this link, and hopefully it will work. My laptop had some shenanigans during the week, it wouldn't connect. So, there we go. So this is the, uh, oh, it's not getting the resolution actually, which is a shame. So this is the query page, and uh, you can see, um, the search thing here, we can add uh, terms to it uh, and it will filter down the papers. So I can search for a specific phrase within the paper or within a certain part of the paper. Uh, I'm just going to put in matrix. 
because there's a couple of them there. Um, there we go. So it's showing the four papers in the database that have got the word matrix in them. But we could say, show me only papers that have the word matrix in the hypothesis, and it would do that as well. So it's really nothing. And also, you can't quite see because it's not fixed on the, the, uh, the screen over there. But you can combine these uh, constraints as well, so you can have like um, loads, loads and loads and loads of these different constraints. And the filter value search pretty really quickly help you find these relevant papers as, as fast as possible. Uh, you can also filter by a paper type, as I was saying before. Uh, you can see case study review. They're not quite fitting on there. Um, and I'll show you the paper profile page as well. So you've got the abstract and the title, and then you've got this chart which uh, demonstrates the, the core, core SD distribution. So you can see what, what it's made up of. Uh, this paper is made up of quite a lot of motivation. Um, there's a, quite a lot of methodology in there. Uh, and it, not a huge amount of, of other things. Um, and as you might expect, there's actually really interesting relationships between the type of paper, so research or review, and the makeup of this pie chart. And that's how we've, we've trained the classified filter based on this core SD stuff. Um, myself, Amanda, and Maria are currently in the process of writing a paper on, on this relationship. Uh, and hopefully, we're going to submit it for BCS conference later in the year. Um, so, that's pretty much it. I'm, I'm kind of disappointed that the, uh, the projector didn't show my program as expected. Um, but if you want to use it, uh, you can go to papro.org.uk. Uh, if you didn't hear that, you want to know how to spell, come and ask me. Um, the other thing is it's open source, and there's loads of machine learning bits and, and PDF conversion bits. So if you want to look at the source code or how it's done or anything like that, again, let me know. Uh, any questions? <laughs> it's all Python and Flask. Uh, Flask is a small um, web framework for Python, but it's kind of like Django, but smaller. Close enough, so hopefully it's copied. Oh, yeah. 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 You can kind of just see the thing. Um, let me scroll over. No, not really. <laughs> yeah, you can kind of just see that. Also, the other thing is, um, if you have any papers, please upload them to the uh, website. Yeah. It's under, the, it's under the MIT license. I don't really like GPL, so. Um, but yeah, um, please upload papers, use the system, let me know if you like it. Uh, we've, we've just rewritten the, the paper processing element so that it's really, really reliable now. So throw those papers at it and also, you know, uh, let researchers know about it because I, I hope that it's kind of useful to them. Okay, thanks very much. So this is one of his paintings. 
And he painted using a palette knife, which is kind of interesting compared to most artists who just use a board brush. And the other interesting thing is his style changes over time quite a lot. So you'll see his early paintings are generally a bit brighter and they have more strokes because he was less practiced with the palette knife. And towards the end of his career, he had quite bad epilepsy. <laughs> and so he didn't want to go out in the sun so much. And his paintings tend to get darker as the days are more, more overcast. So, working with uh, a guy called Lloyd, who's doing a PhD uh, and works at the National Library of Wales, um, we got a data set of him. And this is a project that Hannah has helped quite a lot with. Um, and our idea was we want to be able to classify the era of painting given some analysis on the rest of the data set. And to do that, we can perform a wide, a wide range of analysis techniques from simple stuff like RGB statistical analysis all the way up to looking at the texture of the painting and doing some funky stuff with that. So the other thing we want to do is to validate the results of analysis to make sure they're working fairly nicely. And the other thing we have, because we're working with experts in the National Library of Wales, we can also incorporate some extra knowledge uh, and these take the form of exemplar images for a year. So that's the most representative painting in a set of paintings of years. One thing that came out of this project was a paper. It's currently submitted to the um, International Symposium for Signal Processing and Image Analysis, or something along those lines. Yeah, it's something like that. I can never remember quite what I'm going to But yeah, so me, myself, Lloyd, Hannah, and Lloyd Supervisor Lorna co authored this paper. And it's quite a funky one, and not something you'd usually see. And it's kind of the first time this has actually been done, to our knowledge. So it's a really interesting subject. And we'll see how it goes with the acceptance. So, what were the results of this? So we've got um, Pearson's correlation approaching 0.5. So there's still some work that needs to be done. Perfect correlation would be one where the classified years completely match the actual years. But it's not a low correlation. Um, and also they have good statistical significance. <coughs> so that is, they're not just picked by chance. They were actually correlated. Um, and also onto that, 71% of all paintings were classified within 15 years of their actual year. So we're getting closer to things. And um, one thing was a bit unexpected. Our expert knowledge didn't actually help us much, but it did reveal some interesting things about the data set. So certain paintings were very representational, both within image processing techniques and for the human eye, whereas some were completely different. <coughs> so this is a nice little graph. We use Ken Deere's neighbor for classifying the paintings. So that just takes the K nearest neighbors for a painting and uses the year from those. And um, so as you can see, we've got a range of analysis techniques uh, and the correlation. So for K equals 1, that is just purely classifying based on the nearest painting. And so that you wouldn't expect to be accurate. Whereas when you start approaching higher Ks, you're just classifying based on the average of the data step, and it does go down as well. So we found the best K was around 7 or 8. Oh. A demonstration. So this was actually written for my um, final demonstration of my major project. This is where I did do a demonstration to Hannah and Ray. But it's kind of all command line based at the moment, and there's no point actually demonstrating. But I'll open it up to any questions. The most fun thing, oh, probably investigating some of the image processing techniques. I've never really done computer vision until this point in my life, so kind of interesting and funky. And learning maths a bit more. Have you tried different paintings from any other paintings? 
Uh, we haven't yet. Um, we were going to look at David Holtney, because again, his catalogs are quite open, but we never got around to it in the project. It's not, no. They were quite interested by it. Um, they weren't scared. No, luckily Lloyd is quite tech savvy, so he created what he called a database, which was a Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he would be playing with uh, in the game Excel, so he was a bit more tech savvy about it. Okay, thank you very much. Has everyone thought about it? Yes. Right. Okay, good. So we can do that quickly at the end then. Is that where it is? Okay, I hope it does double. It's set up. Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, super FS. I don't know. I don't know. What's a window manager? <laughs> um, yeah, this uh, is a little bit different from the other talks. Um, if uh, anyone had seen me uh, before here do a talk, it wasn't exactly uh, scientific <laughs> or whatever. Hello, um, <laughs> that's me. Um, I'm David. Um, I don't actually come yet. Um, <laughs> And I've got an idea for a game. Right, it's a game, you're literally in space. <laughs> and you have to kind of, you, you randomly generate it to space, and you're in the middle of space, and you have to spider in space. To spider in space, you have to literally punch bits of space. <laughs> and with those bits of space, you get blocks of space, so you can build stuff with the space. Um, you can build things like spaceships. <laughs> and this, this is really cool. Um, and it's also going to be multiplayer because a, a game is, a, yeah, it's not gaming, it's not multiplayer. <laughs> um, that's a, a screenshot from Shooting Man 9. <laughs> uh, it's also going to be open source, because if I make it open source, then people will come and make the game for me and die. <laughs> 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 uh, it's going to be in Python uh, 2.4, because... <laughs> because that's the only programming language I know, literally. Um, oh, it's going to have boss battles. But you can't have a game without boss battles. You, 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 okay, you have the irregular aliens and whatever, but you have boss battles like uh, Robot Hitler. <laughs> totally original boss battle. Uh, Cody 2012. <laughs> um, People I don't like. <laughs> Invisible and <laughs> Um This is going to be a difficult one because I don't know how difficult it is to render invisible objects. <laughs> so I haven't quite worked out that yet. Um, yeah. The 
I did, again, you have to collect all the seven KSM rules. And, uh, yeah, and then he beat uh, Invisible Obama. Um, I'm, I'm going to have a big start for it. Uh, 30 pounds in the game, because that's a reasonable price. Uh, 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 it's going to be t-shirts. And uh, yeah, I haven't really worked out. I have not been in a business before, so I don't know what the logistics of uh, um, sorting out the t-shirts are. Uh, and I probably will totally do the game and not faff around for a, a year doing nothing and waste the money going to conferences and stuff. Uh, um, but I can't do this by myself. I need people like you, the programmers, <laughs> the programmers. <laughs> but also, we need designers. Designers, yeah. <laughs> designers. Yeah. You want to know how good a design I am? I, this, is, this isn't a picture I made. I got this off the internet. So that's how bad a design I am. Um, yeah, if you want to contact me about this game, uh, my AOL is message name is Panda. <laughs> Actually, uh, I should have changed that slide. Uh, I forgot the password to that one. Uh, <laughs> but if you give me your AOL instant message, I will message you about it if you're interested about it. Okay? Um, yeah. Actually, this talk wasn't about uh, a game I was thinking of making. Uh, I, I lied about that. <laughs> I know, you're all disappointed. Even me. Um, but in the past year, I've been uh, participating in a lot of game jams. Uh, if you don't know what game jams are, they're kind of uh, a bunch of people who have gone together and tried to make a game in a certain amount of time. Um, last year, I participated in a, the Something Awful Game Death Challenge, where me and a group of friends made Chinga Man. Some of you might have heard of it. Um, Fuck this jam where you have to make a game in a genre that you hate. <laughs> uh, I in my very last play, YouTube Channel Simulator 2013 Alpha. Uh, and right now I'm kind of taking part in one game a month, where you have to make the one game a month. <laughs> yeah, um, if you want to look at the, the games that I've made for one game a month so far, you can find it here. Uh, some of the games I made, this is uh, Space Ham. <laughs> this isn't, it was, this was uh, a Gitter uh, game jam last December. Paul uh, Seabrook's Titan Teaser. <laughs> That's the most recent one I did. Uh, the most famous one, uh, Steven's Union Assembly <laughs> Simulator. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think everyone said that. The most the iconic uh, intro, as you know, uh, it took about an hour before I released it. I kind of thought, oh, I need a trailer for it. No, actually, I'll make an intro. And uh, yeah, I just photoshop people's heads on things. <laughs> Wait, you mean there's a game after that? Sorry? You mean there's an actual game after you watch the film? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you sit there the what? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't sit down and think, oh. Uh, uh. Yeah. But, so why do I do, I do these games? Um, it's mainly for learning things. Well, mainly. But it's mainly because, well, it's also partly because I want something to do when I get back home from work from boring spreadsheets. Uh, an XML. Yeah, that, you're right not to laugh there, and that's actually what I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, this is kind of a hobby project for me, and, and see, I, I know that these games are kind of silly, and these games aren't really substantial, or could be the next Minecraft. I, I mean, I, yeah, none of these games are going to be in the next Minecraft. But 
it's kind of a learning process for me, if it is. And being, keeping making games and keeping uh, trying out different things, it's kind of maybe one day I will make that space game. <laughs> <laughs> but probably not. To put it in another way, let me use this to stand top. Imagine four balls on the edge of the cliff. Say so a direct copy of the ball nearest to the cliff is sent to the back line of the balls and takes place in the first ball. Well, the first ball comes to second, second becomes the third, and the fourth falls off the cliff. Game design works the same way. Thank you. <laughs> Stretch goals. Um, I don't know. I mean, I haven't really thought about it to be honest. Uh, anything else? No. Okay. Thanks. This will work the same way as normal PowerPoint. Uh, I have notes for this, and you'll, you'll see why in a second. So I've given a few talks over the past couple of years it's been running. I might say it's been fantastic. Oh, you want me to use this microphone? All oh, right. <laughs> this, is, this is a little bit odd. First, oh, no, first and foremost, I didn't want to follow Davis after that. Um, I'm, I'm still recovering, and uh, I'll be seeking therapy later. Uh, <laughs> I've given a few talks over the uh, past couple of years, and this is probably going to be my last one because I'm leaving. A lot of you are leaving, and I actually just want to say a big thank you to Jonathan Roscoe for organising these uh, to about twice a year at the moment. So thank you. <laughs> and uh, thank you for organising organizing yourself so orderly pizza this year. It was a real success, didn't it? Thank you. <laughs> So each time I talk, I try to do something a little different, and uh, this time uh, will be exactly the same, um, only different. I'm thinking differently. Uh, so there was a little bit of a problem. I've had a huge amount of essays to hand in. I've had roughly two hours of sleep in the past three days. So I decided to sort of throw this together in about 20 minutes, sort of a couple of hours ago. Jonathan told me I only had about two or three minutes, so this is going to be a 60 second presentation. Now, when I start, I can't stop because there's a timer. So if I'm quick, I apologize. Okay. So hopefully this will kick in. Okay, a couple of months ago, I led a class of 25 school children for two days to teach them about the Raspberry Pi and web development. We wanted the children to understand how much work goes on uh, when we access just a single web page. So we created a game where each child... Oh, it's going way faster than I was meant to. 
Oh, Jonathan! Let's, let's start again. Let's try that again. Go! <laughs> so a few months ago, I was doing some stuff with web development and... I'm not counting now. <laughs> hey! Well, we played a game, basically. We were playing a game. I'm just going to ignore these. We played a game that it was, and it was about traversing, and then we got the kids to go up and then start playing with Raspberry Pis. They put them in themselves and set it up because we wanted them to learn how to do it themselves. Oh, there we go. Another thing we did was we got them to use terminal because uh, you know that's what cool people do. So uh, they had to install the patch in PHP themselves. Why did we do this? The reason we did it is we wanted the kids to be exposed to real computing and something a little bit different like Unix. And also, these kids are really quite smart. So what we did was we gave them a normal uh, notepad, or the equivalent of Gedit, I think it was, and they actually made some really cool websites. They started throwing things together using H1 tags. I don't know what the next bit was. Uh, so what was the reason behind doing this? These distant counting threat we talk. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> is designed to go and uh, engage children with computer. The Raspberry Pi is really popular at the moment, so we decided to try and engage children through that. It was surprising how many children didn't know what it was. My background is web development, I taught them web development. On the first day we got them up on their feet and we got them talking about networking. We wanted them to understand what the internet is and what an internet is. So they actually pretended to be packets and they traversed this mini network made of duct tape on the floor which they really enjoyed. We then got them to actually do some HTML and we got them to a, a normal notepad with no idea. We wanted them to realise that you could just start coding uh, with just a bare bones basically. We got them to learn an awful lot about uh, Linux in a very short space of time. They picked it really well on the terminal. So they were doing things like changing directories, updating, uh, printing out lists, updating permissions. Uh, they even learned what, uh, what root was and what to do when they got an error saying you don't have the permission to do that. Uh, and they got a hang of that on day one, they built a basic structure. Day two, we took them back and we started teaching them a bit of CSS. The really interesting thing for me about these children is what happens when you put technology in front of them and give them the opportunity to be creative. Every website was completely different from the other. And they really enjoyed it, and a lot of them have gone away to actually go and do a little bit more and investigate more. So that was an absolute train wreck of a presentation, but <laughs> hey, I think I covered it all right. So there we go. Uh, questions? So, if you want to give away your stickers, if you haven't already, should we take a couple of minutes? Grab the last of the beers. Feedback, feedback, Make sure you do feedback. feedback. Grab some BCS bling and paint and, and information forms. Uh, and then, two minutes, then we'll find out who's won the draw here. Yeah, <laughs> 
This is a, uh, I get the sound, this is a Giordio. Okay. So it's basically a pencil, that's the point, it's a pencil. 
Um, so if anyone needs a pencil, fingers crossed. Has everyone given away their stickers? Okay. So I'll do it the same way as usual. Uh, hands up if you've got more than one sticker. Okay, hands up if you've got more than two stickers. Three stickers. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Is it just Dave? Anyone else with more than seven? Okay, Dave's the winner, which is very tricky. Right, okay folks, as you know, I, I thought I'd introduce one silly thing tonight, but I think somebody else completely by a long way. That was one of the best talks I've ever heard in a while ago. The Road One Orchestra has got about 50 lines of my code, and that's it. Everything else is just integration and loads and loads of other stuff. And, oh, sorry. The rest, of the, the rest of that is about 50 lines of my code, and everything else is just integration. It's just joining stuff together. And in a way, it's an example of doing quite a lot from almost nothing. Um, if anybody is in the final year of project, but they will be next year, we want loads more musical instruments. We've got loads. Um, anyway, there we are. Thank you very much. I'm on it. Feedback if you had a good time or bad time or an okay time, let us know. Change it. If it was horrible, you can help out next time and make it how you want to say. I'm very keen for, for lots of people to get involved and you know, make it as good as possible. So if you have any ideas, let us know. Um, and if you have any ideas where the next one should be, again, let us know. Okay, so if you want to clean up, you're more than welcome to. Can we have a round of applause for Jonathan? Who's done <laughs> The more we hear, definitely. But if you want to help us tidy up, it goes pretty quickly. Thank you.